Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another video. Today we're looking at the GeForce 3 Ti 200. The GeForce 3 Ti 200 was part of a video card refresh from Nvidia. The original GeForce 3 launched earlier and the first reviews could be found around March of 2001. Roughly half a year later, in October of 2001, that's when the GeForce 3 Ti 200, the GeForce 3 Ti 500 and also the GeForce 2 Ti launched. This video card was provided to me by Electromine. We're getting a 20% discount code and there's more information and purchase links down below in the description. The card we're looking at today is Medion branded, however, made by MSI. It's the MS8838. It's got VGA, S video and composite outputs. However, there's an interesting yellow plug at the back and that actually connected to a front bay device giving you S video and composite inputs for video capturing. This video card must have come out of a Medion MD3000 PC sold at Aldi at the end of 2001. Let's have a quick look at the specifications of the card. Here we can see the GeForce 3 Ti 200 in the driver. It comes with 64 megabytes of RAM and the AGP interface uses 4X at its highest. Let's have a quick look at the clock speed. The core clock runs at 175 megahertz and the memory is clocked at 200 megahertz but uses DDR memory so the effective memory speed is 400 megahertz. Let's compare the clock speeds to the other cards. The regular GeForce runs at 200 megahertz for the core and 460 megahertz effective memory. And the GeForce 3 Ti 500 has a core clock of 240 megahertz and an effective memory speed of 500 megahertz. All the GeForce 3 cards have four pixel pipelines, eight texture units and four render output units. However, the GeForce 3 are Nvidia's first GPUs with programmable vertex and pixel shaders. They called it the Infinite FX engine and game developers, it gave them the freedom to program a virtually infinite number of custom or special effects. Vertex shaders, for example, support things such as morphing, keyframe animation, interpolation or procedural deformations. And with the pixel shaders, you could do cool fog effects, uh, bump mapping or per pixel reflections. So in short, instead of being limited by what the video card provided in terms of effects and features, developers could program their own effects. Let's have a look at some demos from 2001 and 2002 to showcase what the pixel and vertex shaders are all about. So here we are in 3D Mark 2001 and the Nature game test as well as the DirectX 8 features really showcase what the GeForce 3 can do. Now we are going to have a look at some more demos to see what DirectX 8 and Pixel and Vertex shaders are all about. But let's have a look at some games. This is Half-Life 2, the uh, collector's edition I believe. And through command line options we can uh, change what DirectX version we're using. So at the moment it's running with the DirectX 8 render path and yeah we're getting yeah, between 20 and 30 FPS but the game looks fairly nice. And um, we're gonna switch over to DirectX 7 just to see the difference in performance and visual quality. And here we are in the game with the DirectX 7 render. So you can see that some of the objects, they only start appearing when you get fairly close. And yeah, there are a lot less effects going on. But on the flip side, the performance is a lot better. So we're getting 100, yeah, up to 100 FPS, 80, 90 FPS here. So um, there was a trade-off. It was visual quality compared to performance. and. Um, quite interesting if you later got like one of those GeForce 4MX cards that uh, were stuck on the DirectX 7 render path. They actually performed really well because most of the games just used the DirectX 7 render path and therefore you got um, high performance and you might not have been aware of uh, missing out on graphical details. 
Another feature of the GeForce 3 is support for shadow buffers and there's one game that really takes advantage of this and this is the original Splinter Cell. It's a big connection with the original Xbox which used the GeForce 3 type GPU as far as I know and uh, shadow buffers was one of the features supported. This is a game that only looks correct on the GeForce 3 and 4 cards. It does have a fallback option using uh, shadow projectors, but it doesn't look as nice. And some shadows, uh, yeah, they just don't look as nicely as with the shadow buffer. So if you have a GeForce 3 and you are a fan of Splinter Cell, this is definitely worth uh, revisiting because some of the shadow effects, they are really gorgeous and showcase what this video card can do. So here we have the readme file of Splinter Cell and we can see the three render options. And if you've got a uh, NVIDIA GeForce 3 or 4, then you can use shadow buffers. Do make sure that you study this paragraph. There's a configuration file and you want to make sure that you are really using the shadow buffer mode. There's also some more interesting information here uh, to do with uh, the origins of the Xbox and the lighting system and the shadow resolutions and all of that. So definitely well worth checking out. Let's have a quick look at some NVIDIA tech demos. The most famous one is probably the Chameleon one. Um, you can see it in a lot of uh, vintage TV shows and video recordings and um, yeah, lots of people run this demo to showcase what the GeForce 3 can do. And basically you can see the uh, Chameleon as it uh, uh, adopts itself to the environment and you can uh, zoom in with the mouse buttons, left mouse button you can uh, to turn around and with the right mouse button you can zoom in and get a little bit a little bit closer you can really see the bump mapping effects and the specular lighting and all of that so really impressive uh, technology for the time so this was all around 2001 2002 and another demo is Salta that really showcases how to do skin and how to mimic a face and if we can if you push on this button, the uh, he talks and we can see the facial expression and everything. And once again, we can uh, zoom in and there's some buttons here. We can choose to, uh, for example, see, see it as a wireframe diagram or uh, a solid shading. And yeah, and once again, very impressive uh, technology demonstration at the time. There are a couple of other interesting features of the GeForce 3 GPU. We already mentioned the shadow buffers and the infinite FX engine with the programmable vertex and pixel shaders. Uh, one highlight is definitely the light speed memory architecture. Memory bandwidth was a huge uh, issue. You just couldn't get enough and high speed memory was very expensive. So what this is all about uh, is finding ways to make the memory bandwidth more efficient either through compression or through other uh, tips and tricks. So basically, um, even though that the memory uh, runs at the same speed or similar speed compared to GeForce 2, because of uh, these optimizations, more, uh, what's the word, effective memory bandwidth could, uh, could get extracted from the uh, memory subsystem. And we also have to talk about anti-aliasing. All the previous GeForce cards used super sampling anti-aliasing. Basically, the game would render at a higher resolution and then scale it down. Um, that was very uh, effective. It removes uh, jaggies from uh, geometric objects as well as from uh, transparent, uh, transparent textures or just plain textures. However, it was at a huge cost in terms of performance, your frames would just really tank. Now, the GeForce 3 supports MSAA, multi-sampling anti-aliasing, um, which performs better. However, it only goes after uh, geometry um, shapes, so it doesn't uh, remove jaggies from textures or uh, transparent textures. So basically, the GeForce 3 can do anti-aliasing faster than the GeForce 2, but in some areas it doesn't look as nice. It also came with a high definition video processor. This was all about accelerating DVD playback, so taking the load away from the processor and doing it on the video card. Let's have a quick look at drivers. You need to select the legacy drivers and then we go to GeForce 3. We can choose the operating systems and supported are quite a wide range of operating systems, Windows 95, 98 and Millennium. We've got uh, XP of course, Windows 2000, but there's also support for Linux and Windows Server 2003 
and I forgot Windows NT4. So yeah, wide range of operating systems are supported. So in terms of anti-aliasing, what you need to do is go into the performance and quality settings and you select this option here. And instead of application controls, you can then force a couple of uh, options. There's also support for anisotropic filtering, but only up to 8x, so no 16x for the GeForce 3. I had a quick go to overclocking. I had very little issues uh, dialing in the clock speeds of the regular GeForce, which is 200 megahertz for the core and 460 megahertz for the memory. If you want to lock this in permanently, you can just uh, grab a BIOS from the regular GeForce and flash it on your card. I've also tried that and that worked without any issues. It has uh, completed all the benchmarks and uh, there's a high chance that if you pick up a GeForce 3 TI 200 that yours will be over that yours can overclock to a regular GeForce 3. So I think it's time to have a look at some benchmark results, but first let's check out the machine I'm using to do all these tests. So we're using an AMD Athlon 64, uh, 4000 plus running at 2.4 gigahertz. The motherboard is an Asus A8V Deluxe and we are uh, using two gigabytes of RAM. I'm also using a fast solid state hard drive, basically everything to give those video cards all the performance that they can show what they can do. So the first benchmark is 3 Mark 2000 Max. Let's quickly go over all the cards that are featured. The GeForce 3 TI 200 is here. We've got the regular GeForce 3 as well as the TI 500. We also got uh, two cards representing the GeForce 2. We've got the regular GTS and the GeForce 2 Ultra. And from the uh, red team representing the Radeon cards, we've got the Radeon 7500, the 8500 LE, which is a lower clocked version of the 8500. So here we can see the TI 200 uh, performs behind the GeForce 2 Ultra. But look, this is just 3D Mark, so uh, it's more important how it does in games. In 3D Mark 2001 SE, we can uh, see the GeForce 3 TI here. Uh, it beats the GeForce 2 cards and it is uh, in front of the Radeon 7500. If you're wondering why the Radeon cards are so strong, and you might uh, have looked at some historic reviews and the consensus was that the cards on paper were very powerful and should beat the GeForce 3 TI 500. However, they didn't and that was because of uh, driver issues. And we luckily now have the benefit of using ATI's latest and greatest drivers with all the bugs uh, ironed out and really good performance. In expandable at 1280x1024, here is our GeForce 3. All the GeForce 3 cards are here. And once again, the Radeon cards are very strong and the TI200 does beat the GeForce 2 Ultra. In Dracon, the GeForce 2 Ultra is ahead of the GeForce 3 TI 200 by a little bit. Um, but if you overclock the GeForce, uh, if you overclock it to GeForce 3 to the regular clock speeds, it's kinda at the same level. Once again, the Radeon cards very strong. Next game is Evolver at 1280x1024. Uh, 51 frames, that is nice. With a bit of overclocking, we're getting to 58. But it's not enough to beat the Radeon cards but the GeForce 3 TI 200 is in front of the GeForce 2 Ultra and also the Radeon 7500. Next game is Quake 3, that's an open GL game. Here the GeForce cards traditionally do quite well. We're getting 125 FPS at 1280 by 1024, so that's plenty. And the Radeon cards, once again, are a little bit faster. Next up, we've got Sirius Sam 1280 by 1024. Here the GeForce 3 TI 200 is behind the GeForce 2 Ultra, but a bit of overclocking and we can see uh, the card makes a huge uh, leap forward in terms of performance. So this is definitely a game where you want to overclock your GeForce 3 card a little bit. In MDK, everything looks nice and orderly. We've got the GeForce 3 TI 200 clocking in with 116 FPS, so that's uh, plenty for smooth gameplay. And here the GeForce 3 TI 500 is able to beat the Radeon 8500 by 1 FPS. And in Return to Castle Wolfenstein, I decided to use a lower resolution because that game is more demanding. We're getting 67 FPS once again in front of the GeForce 2 Ultra and in front of the Radeon 7500. But even in this game, the Radeon cards really perform well.
I also have some power draw results at idle, staring at the desktop. Very similar, the GeForce 3 Ti 500 does stand out. This is a very power hungry card because basically it's just a really highly clocked GeForce 3 with, uh, with the GPUs uh, properly binned for, to, in order to be able to sustain those high clock speeds. Kind of around 84, 83, most of the cards. The 7500 stands out with the lowest power draw. Let's have a look under load. So this is under 3 Mark 2001 SE, the peak power reading that my measuring device uh, picked up. Once again, the GeForce uh, 3 Ti 500 stands out with the highest power drawing, but the Radeon cards also uh, use a lot of power. And uh, in terms of power efficiency, the Radeon 7500 is really the most power efficient card. So let's have a look at prices. Now eBay is my main source of getting my hands on retro parts. I live in Australia, quite regional. There are no uh, computer shops, recycling shops or anything like that or thrift stores. So eBay is my main source and we're just going to have a quick look at prices. So I usually just run the search, then I switch it to worldwide. You gotta cast your net quite wide and look everywhere. And then I search it by pricing plus postage. So the first two cards, these are actually from uh, Electromine. That's, those are the cards that were used in the video with the Medion brand. You can get the 20% discount, uh, but you have to go to their website. I'll put a link down below in the description. And the next card, so we've got a couple here, uh, two from Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, from the UK, but the postage quickly goes up. So here we're talking $40 already. So it seems to me that the going rate is around yeah, 20 US dollars and then going higher from there. Do keep in mind that I am from Australia, so a lot of the uh, cheap listings that you might find in the US, they don't even show up for me. So uh, it really depends on your region in, in terms of prices, but there seems to be very good availability and prices seem to be quite uh, affordable as well. And there you have it guys, this is the GeForce 3 Ti 200. Let's summarize it. A very interesting card, definitely a turning point for graphics with the programmable pixel and vertex shaders and can be found quite easily on eBay and for a low price. So uh, it's not one of those cards that uh, seems to attract outrageous prices from collectors outbidding each other. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really hope I covered all the important bits. If you've got any questions, do leave them down below and share your thoughts. What do you think about the GeForce 3? Did you have one? Did you have a TI? Uh, how did you go with overclocking? All the usual stuff. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe if you haven't done so. Share the video with your friends. Hit the like or the dislike button. And I shall see you soon with another video.